can't imagine a measure of God's love for Jesus Christ to come to earth, his comfort left above to give himself a sacrifice to suffer shame and loss to shed his precious blood for me to die upon a cross he gave himself for me to Open your Bibles, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter number 27. Matthew chapter 27. And as you find that, if you're able, in honor of God's word, please stand. And I think I'll start reading with verse number 22. I'll read the even verses, and you read the odd, if you will. And we will finish on verse number 36. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. Then 
Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And as they came out, they found a man, a Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. They gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And sitting down, they watched him there. Please join us as we look once again to the Lord. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. First of all, that you loved us so much that you allowed your son to die on the cross for us. Secondly, that he loved us so much that he was willing to give of his life that we might be saved. We thank you that we have pictures in the scripture that help us to understand the events and the times of Bible history and the places. Now we ask as we take a short visit to Calvary that you help us to grasp some things that are important and see some things that maybe we need to see Think about some things that need to be thought about and act upon the things which you bring to our memory and to our heart. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Very often I get advertisements wanting me to take a trip to Israel or to bring a group and go to Israel. I've done so a couple times. It's a wonderful place to visit. And the places that we find described uh, in the scripture, in the pages of the scripture, you get to see. I would urge if you ever get an opportunity to take that trip. There are things that uh, you will see and be able to picture in your mind that will enhance just the reading of the scripture. To go to Jerusalem to see what it would have been like when Jesus was there to the garden of Gethsemane where Jesus prayed and sweat as it were great drops of blood to the Mount of Olives where Jesus will return to when he comes to Bethlehem where the cave is there where Jesus was born depending on the tour and the timing you might get to go to see the shepherd's field where the shepherds uh, heard the angels proclaim that Christ had been born Jericho so much Bible history there places like Megiddo and the Dead Sea and the Jordan River where Jesus was baptized are all things that you, you could see and then you go up north and you go to Nazareth where Jesus uh, was from and raised. You go on up and you find the Sea of Galilee where Jesus stilled the waters, where Peter walked briefly on the water. You see the place across where Jesus cast the demons into the hogs and they ran into the sea. Or the side of the hill where Jesus stood and proclaimed 
uh, some great truths found in the book of Matthew. We really read all of these things in the scripture, but when you actually see them, it becomes a little bit more real to you. They're special things. Now, unfortunately, I can't take you all there. I would if I could, but I can't. But if you will, use your mind just a little bit this morning. Picture with me some things that we're going to look at and imagine what it was like at this time when Jesus was crucified. So today, we're going to go there through the scriptures. But do not just listen to the words. Kind of picture in your mind what is taking place. We're going to Israel, but not as it is now. We want to go as it was in the day when Jesus was there. We want to go to the place where Jesus was crucified and he died. And while there, there are going to be a number of things to see and to hear and to learn at that time. So first of all, as we look at Calvary and we see the three crosses and Jesus on the middle of the cross, and then we look around and we see some other things. What do we see? Well, first of all, we see a crowd. There were a lot of people there. A crucifixion in that day uh, was not a small thing. People turned out for it. But the crowd, for the most part, is not a sympathetic crowd. It's not a crowd that's concerned about Jesus. Many of those were, were those that we read about that said, crucify him, crucify him, and his blood be upon us and upon our children. But the crowd, so who is the crowd? Well, first of all, there's some political enemies. Those of the Roman government in particular uh, who were concerned that the Jews thought he was a Messiah and that he might overthrow the government. And so we see that crowd. Uh, those who did not want a religious leader. And then there's the religious enemies. Remember those that are crying for him to be crucified uh, were actually, uh, for the most part, Israelites or Jews. And we see them around the cross. They're all being satisfied. The Roman uh, leaders, the political leaders are being satisfied. The religious leaders are being satisfied as they see these three crosses. And then we look around. There's really only a few friends. Only a few people. And a handful of family. There at the cross. You wonder, where did they all go? So we think about who's not present. Well, we know John was there. We know Judas is dead. But what about the rest of the disciples? We do not read that they're there. I can't say for sure that none of them were, but certainly when you look at scriptures, it leaves a lot of doubt. I wonder... Where were those 10 lepers that Jesus healed? Certainly their life had been changed by him. And now they don't seem to be there. What about the 5,000 that he fed? What about that group? What about those that he raised from the dead? What about those that he healed from their diseases? They don't seem to be there. And then we see the crosses of Calvary, three of them. Today, if we would talk about the crucifixion, we would look at this as being perhaps barbaric. And it was rough. It was a terrible way to die. 
But in that day, it was a common form of execution throughout the Roman Empire. The crosses were usually placed in an area where multitudes could see them, along the roadside uh, where people would pass by. And then we look at Christ on the center cross. And we're drawn to him by the others, actually, and by the words that are said. To the executioners, this was no different than any other execution day. There were three men who were condemned by way of crucifixion. But Jesus makes a difference. By the way, he always does. No matter what's taking place, Jesus makes a difference. He made a difference, for example, at a wedding of, in Cana of Galilee uh, when they ran out of wine and he turned the water into wine being his first miracle. He made a difference. He made a difference at the funeral in Nain where a young man was raised from the dead. And he'll make a difference on this day as well. Then we not only look around, but with our ears we begin to hear the things that are said. We hear the voice of the critics. Look down to verse 39. We did not read there. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. There at this time are those who doubted him, who were willing to make fun of him, who did not believe that he was the Son of God. And so there are his critics. He said, you were the son of God. You said that you could uh, restore the temple in three days, not understanding that he's talking about his body and the resurrection that will take place in three days. But his critics are there. By the way, it doesn't matter what you do in God's work. There are always critics. If you take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be critics. But it should make no difference. It didn't make any difference with Jesus. Now we talked about the religious group that was there. And we hear their voices too. And they seemed to be satisfied. They had called for his blood to be shed and uh, to be upon us and our children. Look at verse 41. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, he saved himself, uh, he saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Jews, let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. Interesting, isn't it? These religious leaders wanted Jesus to conform to their words, to their ideas. They had seen him raise the dead. They had seen him give sight to the blind. And yet they say, now if you do it our way, we'll believe you. Well, they were there. And then there's the voice of the criminals. Look at verse 44. And the thieves also, which were crucified with him, uh, cast uh, the uh, excuse me, cast the same with his teeth. Now, well, we just stop there for a moment. We know what the criminals thought from other passages. We get a little bit more information. But one doubted that he was the. Uh, Savior, he wanted saved from his circumstances. So he said, if you are the son of God, save yourself and us also. The other said something a little bit different. 
Lord, when thou comest into thy kingdom, remember me. One recognized his sin and that he needed deliverance. The other just wanted deliverance from the penalty of sin, not from the sin. And then there's a the voice of the curious. And it doesn't matter what happens, there are always curious people around. Look down to verse 48. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, let me, let us see whether Elijah will come and save him. The thinking was from Scripture that maybe this was Elijah or that Elijah would come and save him and deliver him. And so they're curious to see what happens. You know, we're a curious bunch of people, aren't we? It's amazing. You can be driving along the interstate 70 mile an hour and there be an accident off the side of the road is not obstructing traffic, but you're going 30 mile an hour by the time you get around it. Everybody had to see what took place. Curious people. Well, here there were the curious. And the voice of the centurions were there also. Look at verse 54. When the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly saying, truly, this is the Son of God. There were some because of the circumstances begin to recognize that maybe this was a little bit more than just a criminal being crucified. This could be the Son of God. So we hear all of those voices. But the voice we really need to hear is the voice of the Savior from the cross. It's first of all the voice of forgiveness. In Luke 23 and verse 34, uh, the scripture says, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. Jesus, hanging there on the cross, looks down at those who have called for his crucifixion, who have beaten him, who have planted the, the crown of thorns upon his head, who did all these things and cried for his blood to be shed, to those who drove the nails in his hands and his feet, he says, Father, forgive them. I have tried in 50 some years of ministry to learn to forgive. I don't know how you can hang there on a cross and say, Father, forgive them, except you be the Savior, the Son of God. You and I have problems with forgiveness of anything. But certainly, here, Jesus cries out for those that are actually crucifying him, mocking him, laughing at him, making fun of all that he's said and done. And he says, forgive them. And the reason is, they just don't understand. Now, that's usually a good reason for forgiveness, by the way, because people really don't understand everything. And so Jesus said, these people do not even know what they're doing. They didn't know they were nailing the Son of God to the cross. They thought it was something else. They didn't know that he would be the Savior of the world. They thought it was something else. We hear the voice of salvation. As I mentioned, the one thief. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom in the book of Luke chapter 23. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. We hear the voice of salvation where, when we recognize our need and we recognize a Savior and we call upon him, he is willing to save. Jesus said, all that come unto me, I will 
in no wise cast out. I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. It didn't matter. Salvation was available. Forgiveness was there. That was him. And then we hear the voice of care from the cross. John chapter 19, beginning with verse 26. Jesus therefore saw his mother, the scripture says, and the disciple standing by, which was probably John. Woman, the disciple whom he loved, uh, being John, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. Jesus looks down at his mother and he looks down at John. And he says, John, make her your mother. Take care of her. I care about her. She's going to need your help. If you watch your son die on a cross, you'd need some help too. If you had seen the suffering that Jesus suffered, you'd need some comforting too. The Bible says from that hour, he did just that. And then there's a voice of anguish. If you look back in your text, it's uh, verse 46, uh, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, uh, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And that is to say, my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus, for the very first time in eternity, looked around and recognized he was all alone. The skies are dark, earthquakes are happening. God, the Father, who cannot look upon sin, turned his back on his own son. And Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What a voice of anguish. You and I can't comprehend this. But there had never been a bad relation from eternity past till then. There had never been a separation Jesus did not know what it was to actually carry sin until his sin was placed upon us on the cross. And now he's feeling the anguish of sin. Then there's a voice of humility and of humanity. Knowing that he could not help himself on the cross. Oh, he could have come down if he chose. But he couldn't and deliver you and to deliver me. So in his humanity, in John 19 and verse 28, Jesus, knowing all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now we know that they gave him vinegar mixed with gall. And he refused to drink according to our text. But when we read this, we understand then that he suffered as you and I suffer. He felt what you and I would have felt if we'd have been on the cross, yet it was for us. But then we hear a voice of victory. In John 19, 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished and he bowed his head and gave up the ghost he's not saying they've won he's not saying they killed me he's saying I have finished the job that I came to do I have finished and accomplished that which I came to accomplish I've taken the sin of the world upon my body I'm willing to forgive and save all that will come by faith but all that needed to be done for us to be saved 
was now finished. And then there's the voice of completion. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 46, Jesus cried with a loud voice and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. What powerful words that we get when we listen around the cross of Calvary. But we've seen some things. We've heard some things. So what do we learn? What do we comprehend from these things? Well, first of all, particularly his death, but this death is supernatural. In verse 45, there is supernatural darkness upon the face of the earth. Look, look at verse 45, if you would, please. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. That's not normal. But you see, God is light, and when God turns his back, there is no light. We see supernatural death as we uh, looked in verse 50. When he had cried again with a loud voice, he yielded up the ghost. He gave up the ghost. He said, I lay down my life. No man taketh it from me. I lay it down, and if I lay it down, I will take it up again. Then we see a supernatural display. Look at verse 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. A lot of things happening. The temple, the veil of the temple, was that which separated uh, the, the, the most holy place from the average person. It represented the very presence of God. And the temple now has rent in two. It's divided. You could see in. Because there did not need to be a separation. We did not need a priest to go in and offer the blood uh, and sprinkle the blood on the altar. Our priest just died on the cross. It's supernatural what he did with that. The earthquakes, the rocks broken apart, all part of that. This was a death that was sacrificial. John 129. John the Baptist saw Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. If you remember, the animal, the Lamb, was slain, and his blood was put on the altar. It's the blood of Jesus Christ which cleanses from all sin. We have to be careful because some of the new versions say it's the death of Jesus. It is not the death. It is the blood that cleanses from all sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Jesus became our sacrificial lamb. And this death was also substitutional. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. If you read the scriptures and stop there, you might think that he just died in Barabbas' place because he was swapped. The high priest asked, who should I release then if you want Jesus crucified I, I, and he said they said Barabbas but he didn't just die for Barabbas he died for every man he died for me he died for you so this morning as we think about what we would see at Calvary what we would hear at Calvary then what do we learn? 
as we prepare for invitation, what does Calvary mean to you? Do you know Jesus as your personal Savior? He died for each one of us to redeem us from our sin. As we look back, there were only a handful that remained faithful to him all the way to Calvary. We live in a strange world today. Tonight, by the way, just to throw this in, I'm going to give you a survival kit for all that's going on in the world. We live in a strange world. We do. Where men do not want to take biblical stands. Where people don't want to live for Christ. Oh, they want to feel good about their religion. But they don't want to be committed to serve him. What about your commitment? Are there things in your life that need to be repented of so you can use, be used of God? Or are there things that you just need to do and you said, no, I want my will, not your will. Well, Calvary, if we take a good look, if we listen, if we learn, we'll change our thinking. How about you today? Let's stand for prayer. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed for a moment, each of us take time to search our heart. I wonder, is there one that would be honest enough this morning to say, preacher, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure that I'm going to heaven, but I want to be. Thank you. I want to be right with God. I want to know that my sins are forgiven. Would you pray for me? Is there another? Thank you. I wonder if there's one that say, preacher, I'm Christian. For whatever reason, God knows and I know He's speaking to my heart. There's some things that need to be different in my life. Would you please pray for me? God has spoken to my heart this morning. Thank you. God bless you. Others? Several around the auditorium. Thank you. Another? As God speaks to your heart, now the question is, will you respond to that call? Will you respond to what God has said to your heart? The answer is either yes, Lord, I want your will. I want to be saved. Yes, Lord, I want your will. I want to serve you. Yes, Lord, I want your will. I want to be faithful to you. Or no, I don't want to. There's no in-between ground. There's no middle place. It's either yes or no to God. Heavenly Father, as we conclude the service with invitation to him, It is clear that there are those that you have spoken to this morning, some who need to be saved, others who need to do the right thing in serving you and become faithful to your work. We ask your blessing today upon this invitation time. Help us to respond as you call us to be what you want us to be and to serve you faithfully. And we ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.